Good morning, church family. Take two. All right, we want to, again, we want to thank you for being here with us. We, we praise God for the opportunity to gather to hear the word read, to hear the word preached. Uh, it's a blessing to have God's word in our life. Uh, may we live by it. May we uh, rest in the promises of God. For our reading this morning, we'll be in Exodus 20. As we look at the law this morning, we'll be looking at commandments 9 and 10. And again, as we've been saying, these, these commandments are not as narrow as we think they are. They're wider, they're broader. And commandment 9 reminds us that we should do nothing to damage the name or the reputation of our neighbor. Uh, sadly, it's something that is very easily done. Uh, we ought to be charitable and have that charitable opinion of our neighbor. We should esteem them higher than ourselves. And uh, another difficult thing is we should rejoice in the good name of our neighbor and not desire for harm to come to them. So that's uh, commandment number nine. And then commandment 10 is a, is a big one. Uh, commandment 10 teaches us to rejoice in the providence of God for others and not to wickedly what has given to them. This is not a commandment against wanting specifically, but it's a commandment against wanting what someone else has for you. So if you look at the, the table of the 10 commandments, uh, this 10th commandment is the end of the commandments as we know it. But in that 10th commandment, it's literally the head of the last six. If commandment four is the head of the first four, commandment 10 is the head of the last six that all deal with your neighbor. So if you please turn with me again to Exodus 20, if you're not there already. Exodus 20, verse 16. If you'd please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray together. Before your word, before the face of our God. But Lord, as we stand before you and we recognize the holiness that is distinct to you and you alone, we are presented with our own sinfulness. We see times in which that we have not spoken the truth. We see times where we have desired what others have had or have, and we want that for ourselves. We realize, Lord, that we have not been thankful. We have not been content with all that you have provided so, Lord, we do ask that you would, through your spirit and because of Christ, have a work in our heart today, that we would be humble before you, that we would love those things that you love and pursue the right uh, living that you call your people to. So guide us today, Lord. Forgive us for those times that we, looking back on all 10 of these commandments, we see our failure repeatedly. But Lord, we also praise you that we are not judged by our keeping of these Ten Commandments for salvation. So we praise you in that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Just turn a few pages to your right to Exodus 34. The last number of weeks, we've been looking at Psalm 136. And you all remember that phrase that was repeated verse after verse after verse, his steadfast love endures forever. The one thing I want to just share briefly before we get into this reading is that that steadfast love is actually one word in the Old Testament. It's the word has said. And it has a very unique and I think distinct 
uh, property to it, and that is that it is both addressing our relationship with God and our relationship with others. It's this loyal love that we see perfectly exemplified in Christ. Uh, and it's something that we also see in God in extending grace to us, extending mercy. And this is what God calls of his people. So as we look at this, we see the character of God in Exodus 34, and we'll be, I'll be reading verses five through seven. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And then finally turn to the New Testament, to the book of Titus, We have heard the law, we have heard of the character of God. Titus chapter three, we'll be uh, reading verses three through seven. If you please again stand with me as we read of the gospel of Titus three, three to seven. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness, loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace of eternal life. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we thank You for uh, Your Word. And Lord, a passage like this leads us to both sadness but also great, great joy. Lord, because we see ourselves in this. We see our breaking of your commands. We see breaking your law. We see going against your desires. And we see this throughout the day, throughout the culture in which we live, but Lord, specifically in our own hearts. We see this even before words come to our lips. We see it before actions are accomplished, Lord. We see it deep in us. But Lord, we also see deep within us your spirit at work. We see the constant work of the Holy Spirit guiding us, purifying us, leading us. And Lord, for that, we ought to be eternally grateful that your spirit, because of our faith and trust in Christ alone, your spirit has a work in our hearts. You are faithful. You show this loyal love to your people that is throughout your word. The steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases it's mercies that never come to an end. For each morning we can rejoice that you have not given up, you have not weakened, you have not tired, but you continue to pursue your people and forgive as only you are faithful and just to do. So we praise you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, for the sacrifice of the Son, 
for the work of the Spirit. May we honor you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Malachi, chapter 3. Malachi, chapter 3. We will be looking at verses 13 through 17 this week, verse 18 next week. But before I begin to discuss Malachi, chapter 3, It wouldn't seem right, it would seem amiss, if I did not recommend to you a book on this very passage. Several years ago, a friend recommended that I read this book entitled The Great Gain of Godliness by Thomas Watson. Uh, He's a Puritan, lived in the 17th century, and this short, small book is a passage, it's, it's a series of lectures dealing with this exact passage of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And this book really springboarded me onto my love of reading the Puritans, my love of reading, uh, you know, ancient Christian literature, uh, historic Christian literature. This book is a fantastic read. And if you would like some more, some more depth, in this passage that we're going to be dealing with today and and the one verse next week, this is where you must start, okay? The Great Gain of Godliness by Thomas Watson is a fantastic book dealing with this exact passage, and there will be several quotes in my sermon from this this short book, okay? Now turn, Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 through 17 is what we are going to be dealing with today. And throughout this book of Malachi, we have seen this back and forth between God and the people. God declaring something to the people, the people responding with unbelief, with a questioning evil spirit. And there's been this back and forth throughout the book, and we'll see that again today, which the back and forth nature of this book is in itself amazing, that God would contend with creature, that God would even hear the rebuffs of these people, that he would even condescend to answer their questions is in itself an amazing testament to the steadfast love of God and to his abounding patience, mercy, and grace. He is God. We are dust. May we not forget the creator creature distinction. This back and forth continues throughout the book of Malachi with eventually in chapter 2 verse 17 the Lord saying, you have wearied me with your many words. God gets to this point where obviously this is an anthropopathism, a, a human emotion being displayed to God because he does not have emotions like these. He's not wearied or else he would cease to be perfect being. But he's using this human language to show us that he's fed up with this questioning. And just in the book of Malachi, when you get to chapter 2, verse 17, just when it seems like God's grace has finally run out. You've wearied me with your words. I can't handle it anymore, God says. Just when it seems like his grace has limits, just when it seems like God's patience has come to a stop, he says in chapter 3, Return to me, and I will return to you. His grace still remains. And he continues to lovingly call back a rebellious people to himself. He continues to call them back to walk by faith and repentance. And as we've seen in the book of Malachi, this call to repent, we must remind ourselves that repentance always comes after faith. That if you desire to repent from sin, if you desire to turn from sin to God, the first element that is necessary is belief, faith. Repentance never comes before faith. It's both unbiblical and illogical. Because for you to repent from sin, you must believe that the God accepts repentance and that's what he desires. You must have faith that what God desires is repentance. Repentance always flows from 
faith. And God calls the people in the passage that we, we looked at the last few weeks and again in today to walk by faith, to manifest that faith through deeds of repentance. And we saw last week as Pastor Pat preached that not only does God gently call His people back, but He promises a blessing on them for His work in their life. As Augustine once said, God crowns His own grace. He calls His people back and promises a blessing. And all these blessings are ultimately fulfilled for us in and through Christ, the Blessed One. But today we are going to deal with this passage, verses 13 through 17. So please, if you would stand as I read the Word of God. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping His charge? or of walking in mourning before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before Him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed His name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. You may be seated. We see a distinction, and even next week we'll be dealing with this. There's a distinction being made here between two groups of people. There are two types of people being discussed today. In verses 13 through 15, we see group 1. And in verse 16, we see group 2. What divides these two groups of people is their attitude and response to God's Word. Belief versus unbelief. Repentance versus no repentance. And see, this is not a unique situation and circumstance to the book of Malachi. All of humanity that has ever lived has fit into one of these two groups. They're either in that, you're either in that group that responds by faith and repentance to the hearing of God's Word, or you're part of group one who hears God's Word and instead wickedly questions God, questions His veracity, and says, you know what, I don't know if I buy what God's Word has to say. See, the, the situation that Malachi is dealing with was not unique simply to a group of people 2,500 years ago. This passage applies to every generation. This passage applies to each one of us in this room this morning. All people either fit into this group 1, verses 13 through 15, or into this second group, verse 16. There is no third party. You're either for God or against God. You're either one of His people or not one of His people. And this is, this is true that all people divide into these two groups. This is true not only when we compare generally the world to the church. This is also true even more specifically within the church itself. Because remember who God is talking to. He's talking to those who identified themselves as the people of God. And God is showing that even in those that identify themselves to be the people of God, there's two groups. See, we can often just think that these, these, these calls of, you know, the wicked, the ungodly, those are for the world. They're not for us. No, God is addressing His people here and saying, even amongst my people, there is a distinction that I will make between those who truly are my people and those who simply claim to be my people. This, this distinction is not just seen in the world and the church. It's even seen in the church, in those people who claim to be the Lord's. God declares through His Word the sin of the people. God calls His people to walk by faith in Christ and to repent of their sin by turning from it unto good works. This is the call of God to every age. This is the call of God to you this morning. 
You cannot just be a bystander when you hear God's word. You're not just a spectator when you hear God's word. God, even this morning, is calling for you to make a decision. Are you for me or are you against me? The hearing of God's word always comes with a decision to be made. Are you going to hear by faith and respond accordingly? Or are you going to harden your heart and say, I choose to disbelieve the spoken word of God? This morning, we're going to examine three things about this passage. We're going to see what characterizes this first group. We're going to see what characterizes this second group. And then we're going to begin to look at God's response. And we will finish looking at God's response to these two groups next week as we do with chapter, uh, verse 18 of chapter 3. So first, let us start by looking and examining this first group, verses 13 through 15. And again, I'll read this passage for you. In Malachi 3, 13 through 15, the word of the Lord says this, You have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or of walking in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. See, God calls his people, calls out his people's sin. This is what you've done. And these people respond to God's accusation. They respond to God's law in three ways. And it's a downward spiral. It gets worse and worse as we go in this passage. The first thing the people do when they respond to God's condemnation, to his sentence of judgment on them, to his declaration that you have sinned against my holy law, you've been hard against me, your judgment of me is wrong. The first way these people respond is they question God's word. They do not humbly receive it by faith. God, you are right. Let every man be deemed a liar. You alone are true. I accept your word. Even if I don't understand how I've broken your law, I submit to your word. Help me see my sinfulness. They don't respond that way. They respond with a questioning of God's word. How have we been hard against you? Again, they question not only God's veracity, his truthfulness, but they question his omniscience, whether he really knows what he's talking about. God, I think you must be mistaken. How have we been hard against you? I, I think there's an untruth coming from your lips, Lord. How, how have we sinned? How have we violated your commandments? They do not respond in, hum, in humility, in, in, in humble confession of sin. They respond in arrogance by wickedly questioning God. And this is step one in the downward spiral of unbelief. When you do not accept God's word to be true, you begin to wickedly question it. Well, how, how do I know that that's really legit? How, how do I know that God means what he says? This is the starting place of unbelief. This is the first step down the stairway of destruction. When you wickedly question God's word. But not only do the people wickedly question God's word and say, how have we sinned against you? They throw in the towel spiritually. The second thing that they do is not only do they question, they give up. They declare that all this mourning over sin, all this faith stuff, it's pointless. It makes no difference in my life at all. And look what they say in verse 14. You've said... The people have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge? What, what does the profit mean to walk in obedience to his commandments? What, what is the profit of walking in mourning before the Lord of hosts? What is the point of always being broken over my sin? This doesn't affect, this doesn't change my life at all. I, I'm done with this. They begin to question God's word. That then leads to despair, giving up hope. You know what? I've tried this Christianity stuff. I thought it would make my life better, but my life still stinks. I thought this would make my life better, but my life is still filled with hardship. You know what? I'm done. You know what? This is not for me. 
they give up. There's no advantage to any of this Christianity stuff. It seems to make no difference. You know what? Not only does it make no difference, but I look around, it seems fake in everybody. How many times have you heard, the church is just full of hypocrites. I'm done. You throw in the towel on the Lord and on His Word. This is the second step and the path to destruction and the downward spiral of sin. The wickedly of questioning God's Word, the throwing in the towel spiritually, and then this ultimately leads to the third step, the third phase, which is you begin to outwardly speak blasphemous lies about God and His ways. You start by questioning, wickedly questioning God, and there is a right way to question God's providence, and we'll see that. But you wickedly question God's providence. You began to disbelieve any of the veracity of God's word. Then that will lead to you ultimately becoming a blasphemer. Where not only do you say, I don't believe it, but you actually take a stand against the Lord Almighty and you begin to make accusations against him. You begin to speak lies about his ways. Again, verse 15. And now, so these people first say, what have we done wrong? You know what? I don't see any point to any of this. And then we get to verse 15. Now they are calling the arrogant blessed. You start looking at those who are living in outward rebellion against God and saying, that's the good life. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put the Lord to the test and they escape. This whole idea of judgment, of justice, I don't buy any of it. I see what happens in the world, and those who live for sin enjoy themselves. You know what? I doubt anything that God says is true. You know what? Just eat, drink, be merry. Let the philosophy of Epicurus rule the day. They begin to speak open lies about God and His ways. Step three is that not only do they doubt God's word, not only do they disbelieve God's word, but they begin to actively oppose God's word. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, also speaking about this downward path of sin, says it this way in Romans chapter 1, verse 32, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Not only are they engaged in sin, but they are encouraging others to sin. And that is exactly what you see here in verse 15. Not only are the people engaged in sin, but they are encouraging others to engage in sin by their wicked words. Come sin with me. This is the good life. Misery loves company. Do you see the downward cycle here? The questioning of God, the giving up spiritually, this always leads to outright rebellion. The psalmist begins the book of Psalms this way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. Do you see the downward, the downward trend there too? You begin by walking, you get a little more firm in your sin, you stand, then you take your seat with them. You are now so comfortable in sin, you are now sitting with the enemies of God. There is a downward pro a progression that we see in this group one. And it all starts with wickedly questioning God's word. Where are you at in life? Does group one define you? Have you chosen to take your stand against the Lord of hosts? Are you questioning whether God actually knows what he's doing? Do you have evil intent in your heart as you question God? Have you given up? Have you said to yourself, I see no profit in any of this. I throw in the towel. Let me eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I might die. I'm done with this Christianity stuff. Are you choosing to side with those that dwell in the land of the cursed? 
Do you see God as an overly harsh potentate? Are your thoughts of God harsh? When you think of God, what comes to your mind? Is the first thing you think of God a heavy-handed, unjust judge who's out to ruin the fun in your life? This is an evidence, my friends, that you have taken your stand in the camp that is against the Lord. If so, if this is where you stand, even this morning, I appeal to you, repent of your folly. Confess your unbelief is sin. Understand that you are standing even right now in the camp of those that are in the enemy of God, the camp of the deceived, the camp that has the banner waving over them of the serpent. My prayer even for you this morning is that the Lord may open your eyes so that you begin to see clearly who God is as He's revealed Himself in His Holy Word. Do not use your twisted, faulty reason to come to conclusions about God. Take God at His word. But sadly, most people are in group one. Even, not just in the world, but sadly, even in the church, many are in group one. They're willing to walk by faith as long as things go well with them. But as as soon as things start to go bad, you begin to see the heart being revealed, the wicked questioning of God's providence, the throwing in the towel spiritually. And then do not be surprised if you see them a while later living in outright rebellion against the Lord. This is the slippery slope of sin. Now let us examine group two. That's group one. The wick- they wickedly question God. We've not been harsh against you. You are mistaken. You know what? This is all pointless. You know what? It's actually better to sin. Now let's see and examine group two. And this we find in verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord, the word of the Lord says, spoke with one another. Those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. See, group two heard the same exact word of God as group one. The same word was preached to both groups. But group two, they hear the same word preached about their sin, and this group responds, in a way that evidences God's internal working of grace in their hearts. And the first thing we see in the second group is the fear of the Lord. Those who feared the Lord, and then a little later on in that verse, and esteemed His name. And that that is what fearing the Lord means, by the way. Esteeming the name of God. Holding high, giving honor to God's name. As Watson said in his book, The Great Gain of Godliness, he said this, the fear of God is the sum of all true religion. The fear of God is the very foundation of the saint. Godly fear is the leading grace, the first seed which God sows in the heart of His people. Godly fear, this divine fear, is a reverencing and an adoring of God's holiness and a setting of ourselves always under His sacred inspection. It's the realization that there is an infinite distance between God and us. This is what godly fear is. A remembering that He is God and that we are dust. A remembering that all our ways are done in plain sight of the Lord. As Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, all things will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we all must give an account. This second group of people, they fear the Lord. When the Lord speaks, they listen. 
when the, when the Lord declares something, they, they bring themselves under God's word. They realize that they are under God, that they are in submission to God and his word and his ways. This is what it means to fear the Lord, to be under God, to bring yourself in submission to God, to remember that he is God and that I am dust. Who am I to wickedly question God? Who am I to, to, to cast a stone at God to say he's done something wrong? There's nothing wrong in God. The problem is always on this side of the equation. Even if I don't understand it, the problem's here, never there. This is godly fear. The second group, they hear the word of the Lord and they fear God and esteem his name. The fear of the Lord always goes along with faith. Again, Watson says this, God in his great wisdom couples these two graces together, fear and faith. You cannot truly have one without the other. You cannot have, be a person of great faith in God but not fear his name. Because God's word calls you to fear his name. And if you're not walking in obedience, it shows that your faith in God's word is not there, non existent, weak, small. The fear of God and faith always go together. They're always holding hands. As Watson said, they're always graces that are coupled together. They cannot, you cannot divorce, you cannot separate fear of God and faith. What God has joined together, let none of us try to rip asunder. The fear of the Lord and faith always go together. And the fear of the Lord always leads to repentance. Because the fear of the Lord, again, is bringing yourself under in subjection, in submission to God and his word. You cannot bring yourself under God's word and not repent of your sin. The fear of the Lord always leads to repentance. So if you're asking yourself, how do I know if I fear God? Begin asking yourself the questions. Do I take God's word to be true? Do I strive to live in submission to his word? Do I confess my sin? Am I praying that God would show me my sin so that I, because I'm eager to confess my sin? Do I pray as Psalm 19 and pray as Lord, reveal to me the hidden sins of my heart that I'm not aware of so that I may confess them, Lord? This is an evidence that the fear of the Lord dwells within your heart. The fear of the Lord always leads to repentance. This group of people they hear the word of God about sin, about faith, about repentance, and they accept it. They believe it to be true. They take God at his word. This is the fear of the Lord. They do not add to God's word. They do not take away from God's word. They accept God's word as it is and bring themselves in subjection under it. This is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 19 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The inverse, the opposite is also true. The lack of fear of the Lord is the highway of folly. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The end of the matter is this, to fear God and obey his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But not only do these people fear the Lord, the scripture also tells us that they talk to one another. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. They talk with one another about what God's word says. This is not mindless, wasted speech. This is not saying that they began to talk with one another about the weather outside, about the economy, about the political situation that they found themselves in in that day. No! The people of the Lord talk to each other about the Lord. And there was not, was not wasted speech here. The godly speak of God. They're, they can't be silent. They speak to one another about God and God's word. Because they're thinking about God and God's word. If you're never speaking to others about the word of God, understand this. That is simply an evidence that you think nothing about God. Because what you say is just a reflection of what you're thinking. If you're not speaking about God, that means you have no thoughts about God. Which is not a good place to be. Again, Watson says this, without holy thoughts, true religion is void. If your thoughts are not about the Lord, 
Your religion is in vain. A good test to see where your heart is is to take stock of your thoughts. You may say with your lips, I really love God. I am so thankful to God for Christ. Okay, that's good to say that. But where is your mind throughout the day? What are the words coming off your lips in your home? If those who are in your family were to say one thing about you, would they say, he loves, she loves to speak about the Lord? Always telling me about things that you learned, that you thought about. The goodness of God is always on your lips. These people talk about the Lord together. They encourage one another with God's word. They're not talking with one another about grumbling, complaining, gossip. They're not harshly rebuking one another. They're speaking to one another words of encouragement from God's holy word. Words of comfort. These people were talking with one another with the goal of bringing others with them in their knowledge of God. That's why we talk to one another. I want you to come with me as I'm growing, as I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. Hear this thing. Hear this word of the Lord. We are to speak the word of God to one another. Watson says this, Have you tasted the honey of the word? Let others have a taste with you. A man who hoards his honey is a fool. But a man who is generous and shares with the needy is wise. Do you share with others what the Lord is teaching you? Do you share with others the good things of the Lord? Or on your lips is there always found speech of grumbling, complaining, worldly talk. It's okay to talk about things in the world, but does that define you? Are you known as the political guy? Repent of that sin. Are you known as the guy who's always talking about this thing or that thing of the world? Is it always sports flowing from your lips? Repent of your mindless faith. Begin to think about the Lord and speak to one another about the things of God. Thomas Watson also says this, What a man delights in, that man will speak of. What you delight in, you will speak to others of. The godly hear God's word, they take it to heart, and they act accordingly. And they seek to bring others with them in godliness. Does this group represent you? Now, obviously, we would have to in humility to say, but this is truly my desire, Lord to walk in repentance, to tell others of your goodness, to model your goodness to those around me? Is your goal, husband, in your home, is your goal to talk to your wife about the things of the Lord? Are you washing her with the Word? Parents, is your goal to raise your children up in the knowledge and fear of the Lord? You do this by talking to them about the Lord. Is your goal in, when you come to church to encourage on others by showing your submission to God's Word as you listen attentively and then leave here discussing what you've heard to others? Is this your goal? Do you fear the Lord? Do you talk to others about the Word of the Lord? Lastly, let us briefly look at how God's response, the beginning of God's response here. And we find this in verses, the end of verse 16 and verse 17. The word of the Lord says this, The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him to those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. The Lord takes notice of His people. Nothing is outside of the inspection of God. He sees the hearts and deeds of the righteous. He sees the hearts and deeds of the wicked. The Lord paid attention and heard them. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. 
He pays attention to his children and he hears their prayers. He takes pleasure in their faith, although our faith is so feeble and weak and fragile. Even though our faith is so flawed, even with doubt, or as one writer said, the seed of atheism dwells in the hearts of even the saints. Even though our faith is crippled with doubt at times, the Lord still sees that mustard seed of faith and delights in it. Things that we call weak, God calls amazing. He delights in His people and takes notice of them. He does not disregard their weak and feeble faith, but He pays attention and He hears them. As Peter says in 1 Peter 3.12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The Lord takes notice of them, of the righteous. The second thing we see here in God's response them in his book, a book of remembrance. Obviously, this is a picture for us. The Lord does not need a book to help him remember. He does not need a book to be opened at the end of days where, oh, whose names were in that book again? He knows who are his. This is a picture for us to help us in our weakness. A book of remembrance is made. This idea of a book of remembrance, this is borrowed. This is an illustration, a picture that is borrowed from the kings of old, the practice of old. In those days, those who faithfully, loyally served the king would be recorded in something called a book of remembrance. And the king would at times, when he desires to honor those faithful and loyal subjects, he would have this book of remembrance recalled and read to him. So his mind would be reminded of his faithful servants. You see this in the book of Esther with King Ahasuerus or Xerxes and Mordecai. He could not sleep. He has the book of remembrance brought in to him. And he tells them to read. Uh, he tells his scribe to read to him of those who have been faithful to him. And Mordecai is read of. He's brought to the attention of King Ahasuerus and he is blessed and, and, and riches and abundance are poured out on him. What a beautiful picture that is, by the way, of the final judgment of God and his people. This book of remembrance, they're written in this book of remembrance. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, your works are not done in vain. Though you may not see immediate rewards, though you may not see any rewards, any acknowledgement in this life, the Lord does not forget the faith and works of His people. Your works are not in vain. There is a book of remembrance being written where the Lord will open this book and recall the faith and the deeds of His saints. Oh, the goodness of God. We so often forget his good works. Yet he never forgets ours. So as we think about the goodness of God, may we, one thing, let us seek to model the Lord in this and focus on the good in the saints rather than all their shortcomings. Is your eye constantly on the failures of other people? Or are you modeling in God and do you have a gracious eye toward others? The Lord takes notice of his people. He records them and their deeds down in a book of remembrance. So it'll be recalled on one day. And then lastly, what we see here is the Lord declares that they are his. In verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. The godly belong to the Lord. The God of glory looks down from on high on those who are his, and he says, they are my treasured possession. The people of God are the most valuable 
thing that God has on this earth, what he looks down from heaven and takes joy in and delight in, is his people, the bride of his son, those that he chose from eternity past to be united into one, to be given to his son. This is what the Lord values on earth. He values his church. And he looks down from heaven and says, these are the precious jewels on the earth, my people. And I will gather them together as a king gathers together his, his gold. I will gather together my people, my treasured possession. Are there any more sweet words in all of holy writ than those? That he will gather his people together as a treasured possession. That those who believe in Christ Jesus are considered by God to be very valuable to him indeed. And he says not only that he will gather them together, but he will spare them as a man spares his son. God calls himself the father of his people, and he will deal with his own people as a father deals with his child. Those who have children and even those who don't, you can imagine and, and kind of visualize the affection, the care that a person has for their child. There is... There, there is Nothing really in this earth that is so close to a person's heart as their children. E. Thomas Watson said this, all the affections that a parent has for their child come from God. And they're meant to turn our eyes back to God and show us a picture of his affection for us. Then Thomas Watson said this, the saint does not love their own soul as much as God loves their soul. His affections are for his children. And you see that even, even with a parent. Your child can do something so foolish and, you, and you, you want them to realize, I care more about you right now than you care about yourself. Why can't you see that? That's from the Lord. And that's to bring our minds heavenward to remember that God cares more about our souls than we care about our own souls. He will spare his people as a parent spares his child. So in conclusion, as you consider these words, let me ask a few questions. Have you heard the word of God? Have you heard the word of God? And, and do you believe the word of God about sin, about grace, about Christ, about faith, about repentance? Have you believed God at his word? Do you acknowledge your sinfulness before the Lord? Do you believe that salvation is found in no other name under heaven but that of Christ Jesus? Do you put no stock in your works, but all your hope lies in Christ crucified and risen again and ascended in glory? Is it your desire to strive to live this life for the glory of God because He is God and He has done so very much for you? If so then take heart. Know that the Lord takes notice of you and your faith. Know this, that those who believe in Christ have their names put in the book of remembrance, or as Revelation refers to this book as the Lamb's book of life. And it will be opened one day, and because of your faith in Christ, your name will be found written therein. And your faithfulness to the king will be publicly recalled. Just as Mordecai's faithfulness was publicly recalled to all, so the book of remembrance will be opened and your faithfulness will be recalled. Remember this, that you have been bought with a price. You belong to the Lord. You are his treasured possession. Or as the psalmist says, the apple of his eye. This is the promise of God to those who fear him and walk by faith. He promises to save those who walk by faith. All people are in one of these two groups. This morning, take stock of your own heart and soul. Do you hear the word of the Lord? Do you fear God when he speaks? Do you see his gentleness and tenderness calling you to Christ to find comfort for your troubled soul? Look away from yourself. Look upon the bounty and goodness of God in Christ and keep your eyes fixed on Him as you seek to run the race of holiness by faith. For God and for the good of one another. As we live by faith, 
striving to walk in the fear of the Lord, producing life of good, a life of good works, remember this, there is a great gain to godliness. Stand with me as I close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that is here declared in your word that you are faithful and that, Lord, we confess that more often than not, we as your people are faithless. Help us in our weakness, Lord. Increase our faith. Grow us in the fear of the Lord so that we might strive to walk in obedience to your word so that we might talk more of your word to one another, that we might, as husbands, be encouragers to our families where we are pointing people to your goodness, to your loving kindness, to your steadfast love, to your faithfulness, to our children, Lord. And may we show them the bounty and goodness of the Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for where we sin. May you not hold our sin against others. May you quickly convict us, Lord, of how we waste so much of our speech. May we delight more in you so that we speak more of you to others. May we not be clouded by sin. Keep us from the camp of those who are your enemies. May we not wickedly question your word. May we not throw in the towel spiritually. May we not blaspheme, but may we walk in the fear of the Lord all the days of our life, so that on that day when the book of remembrance is opened and our Lord and Savior Christ stands as our judge, we will smile and hear, come into my presence in the presence of my Father. Encourage us with those words this morning. In Christ's name, amen. You may be dismissed.